All right, well, good evening. It is a wonderful privilege to be with you all this evening. We are going to be continuing forward in our book study of chapter 9 in our book that we've been in uh, by Brother Jerry Bridges, uh, The Fruitful Life. And uh, I'm, man, I am excited for this chapter this evening. I don't know that we have covered or gotten to a more practical chapter than the one we're going to be in this evening. If you have read ahead, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, tonight's fruit of the Spirit that we're going to be studying is faithfulness. Faithfulness. And, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of things, and, and I think, I hope that what this maybe has revealed to you or will reveal to you this evening, if you haven't read ahead yet, is that too many times when it comes to spiritual things, we over-spiritualize them. We over-spiritualize them. And here's what I mean by that. We think in terms of faithfulness, and what we expect is somehow that is something that God is just going to accomplish on our behalf. We hear these words, these biblical words, uh, and, and we grow up with them in church and in our, in our lives and in our backgrounds and in vacation Bible school and all of those things, and suddenly they become an assumed reality to us that's not really thought through. Uh, when I say the word faithfulness, I think everyone would say, absolutely, I faithfulness. But when you start breaking down in a definitive way, what does it mean? What does it mean? What does it mean for us to have faithfulness. It's a fruit of the Spirit. It's certainly a commanded reality for the believer. And yet too many times I'm afraid that we just think in terms of, well, I'm a Christian. Therefore, faithfulness is a part of my life without ever doing the work of thinking, what exactly is faithfulness? Am I displaying faithfulness? Am I, in fact, being faithful in the life that I'm called to live? Have I defined it as God has defined it? Have I, have I viewed it that way? And so I'm so thankful for this chapter because it's just such an easy kind of uh, takes a very common word. That is a church, a biblical, a Christian word, faithfulness. It's not limited to that, but certainly if you grew up in the church, the word faith or faithful or faithfulness is something that was a constant part of that. It's like grace. You know, I'm afraid that we've lost the amazingness of grace and the commonality of its usage. And, and it's good to be reminded at times of, of how amazing grace is and, and how practical faithfulness is. And so to, to say that, let me, let me just say this. This is a really great display in this chapter of, of these fruits being manifested in both in our personal lives and in our character. That this isn't a just, oh, well, that's in the Bible. This is, okay, wait a second. This has distinct meaning. In other words, if you've read the chapter or as we walk through this chapter, you're going to see characteristics that you desire and demand from others in relationship with you. You're going to see that faithfulness is, in fact, an extremely practical character of a person's life. And it's one that you will say is a good character. In other words, it, it's, it's really interesting to me as we've been studying in, in our passages in Matthew how much there is to be evidence of God's work in your life, right? That's what we looked at just this past week. It's not that God is saying by having done these good deeds to others, we are therefore because of those good deeds going to be welcomed or excluded from his kingdom or from heaven. What he's saying is those good deeds are giving evidence of God's blessing, your heavenly father's blessing upon you and the reality of who you are. That because Jesus Christ has saved you, because you have been born again into a new creation, your life will give evidence marking that truth. And the major evidence, we've talked about this, but just as a reminder, we're, we're coming towards the end of the book. And just as a reminder, I want to say this. One of the marked things throughout Scripture that is the measurement of a genuine believer, you'll see it throughout Scripture, it'll say you'll know them by their fruits. Now, fruits can, very broad spectrum, just be the general character of a person's life, right? If someone is bearing fruit that shows dishonesty or shows bad character, then you can see that, obviously. But more specifically, the reason that is a measurement of your salvation, of your regeneration, is because regeneration, salvation, being born again, these are a work of God, wherein he makes someone a new creation. So what are the actual fruits that are the evidences of salvation or conversion? 
Well, we can definitively say, obviously, the fruits of the Spirit. That's why they're called that. They're what the Holy Spirit gives. And we looked at how that couples together with now they've been given and how do we cultivate, water, grow these things in our life. But that's why they're measurements of our conversion. Because you cannot in your own flesh produce these with consistency to the degree and definition that Scripture speaks of them. Remember the first one we looked at, love. Love. Love's a very popular term. Is that me? Again? We tried a new mic, but I don't know exactly what is going on. Hopefully that corrects itself. So don't even bring that to me. I can't use that. I'll be distracted the whole time. Um, So when we think in terms of what are the evidences of salvation, well, they must be something that God himself is producing. Because if I could produce them, if I could in fact produce those things, then it would not be a picture of salvation. Right? If I in my flesh could on my own merit or strength produce them. So when we think in terms of faithfulness, and we were talking about love. Love's a very popular term in today's society. And it's a very misunderstood and abused term. It's it's underdiagnosed. It's partially defined. And this is where I want to be clear. Because we define love biblically. And there's multiple references that always display love is something that takes action. Right? Love is sacrificial Right? Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. There's an action that always couples itself with genuine love. Or we can look in in 1 Corinthians 13 at the love chapter and it gives a description of actions or practices that love will display. Uh, Love is patient. All those things that we see. So in the same way, when we have these things, what I want us to do is not think in terms of, well, faithfulness is a fruit of the Spirit. I have no idea what it means. I hope I'm doing it. But we can actually know what it means. We can define it and rightly then begin to practice it. And that's what this entire chapter is about. One of the things that I think we forget, in and of ourselves, we are not good. I remember I did a men's conference one time uh, up in kind of what's known as the Bible Belt. Uh, in the Bible Belt, where, where the majority of people, and you ask the majority of people that live in, in what's known as the Bible Belt here in the United States, are you a Christian? Absolutely. Right? There, there's not even a question. Of course I'm a Christian. Like they're offended that you even ask them that. And I remember teaching at this men's conference and, and, and preparing for it and thinking, man, what can I say to 500 men who, who man, they, they've heard uh, the gospel. They, they've walked through this. They're men who believe that. They're, they're, you know, in many ways, men of integrity, solid, hardworking guys. And so I remember getting up there and teaching from Matthew 11 and just saying, what I want us to understand this evening is that the reality of becoming a Christian is that good people do not become Christians because Jesus came to save sinners. And so the very first thing that a man must realize is that he is a sinner deserving of condemnation so that he will then cry out for a savior. If you're saying, well, I know I'm a Christian, I'm a good person, that's a struggle. If someone says, I know I'm a Christian because I'm not a good person, but by the grace of Christ, he is redeeming me into his image or making me a good person, man, then we have something that biblically I can look to and say, aha, there it is. That's what it's defined as. And so that's an important distinction. And I say that to say this. One of the things I hope you learn through the fruits of the Spirit is that when you receive Christ as your Savior, he makes you into good people. And that's going to be displayed in every facet and area of your life. So with that, we're going to look at faithfulness. And I just want to give you a basic heading for the practical simplicity of this. What we're going to see in this chapter is, number one, that God is faithful. God is faithful. Right? That's what we believe. That's what we stand on. He is honest and he is dependable. If he says it, I believe it and I will act in accordance to it. When Jesus says that he came, that I might be redeemed and have eternal life, if I would trust in him, I'll take that to the bank. Right? Because we believe that God is faithful. What he says he will do, he will do. What he says will be accomplished because of his strength, it will be accomplished. We can believe that no matter the circumstances. No matter the seasons, no matter any of those things, God is faithful. And then the secondary part is quite simple. Are we? Are we faithful? Because faithfulness is this fruit of the Spirit that we are called to, commanded to, and gifted with 
to the accomplishment of. You should see this being worked out. There, there should be conviction over this if there's lacking in it. And brothers and sisters, if you've read the chapter ahead of time, there's lacking. We're human. There's going to be that. Let me just prepare you ahead of time. No person apart from Jesus Christ measures up to this standard. And we're going to talk about how do we continually strive for that which we do not achieve. And why is that such a marker of Christianity? So with that, he begins on page 111, walking through the word faithfulness. What, what does it mean biblically? Which is, if I can encourage you with anything, I would encourage you in your Bible study, do not neglect taking the time as you're studying when you come to words and you recognize them. And this is, this is a big word to my faith, meaning words like grace, atonement, uh, salvation, right? These are Christian words that are commonly heard growing up in church. I heard this word all my life, uh, whatever it might be. A new one that maybe some people are hearing more frequently is sanctification. When you come to that word, spend a few minutes and ask yourself, do I know what that means? Do I have a good biblical understanding of that word? Because if I'm going to study this, if I'm going to study it with a desire that I might do it, I should understand what it's asking of me, what it means. And so I would encourage you, and he talks about it, opening his concordance. And if you don't know what a concordance is or don't have one, see me or Ransom afterwards. We can set you up with that, show you how to use it quite simply. There's some digital ones that we can easily get you to put on your phone if that's easier. There's, there's all kinds of resources for you in this so that you can see this. And so he opened his concordance and he looked at the word faithfulness. And as he quickly ran his finger down the column, he counted more than 60 references in the Bible to the faithfulness of God. More than 60. And he says more than 40 of those were in the Psalms. And what he's saying is, is, is quite simply that that's expected. Do you, do you know why that's expected? Why, is, why does that make sense? Why does it make sense that God's faithfulness is an absolutely massive theme on the pages of Scripture? Because we are those who are utterly dependent upon God. What does scripture say that we can do in our own strength? Not a little bit, not 20%, nothing. But what does it say that in Christ we can accomplish? All things, all things. There is an utter dependency. And so if God's not faithful, we're in big trouble right? If God's not faithful. And so because of our utter dependency, God has faithfully given us so many reminders of why that's not a bad thing. Guys, in our lives, the truth is, even those whom we are most dependent upon, most trusting of, they're still sinners. There will be. That's why we need forgiveness. Because even those whom we love and are closest to are imperfect. They are sinners. And so there must be forgiveness in that relationship for it to function. This is a continual, constant reminder that God is faithful, that you can trust him. Why is that important? Because today might be great, and you might be trusting God singing from the rooftops, and tomorrow, tomorrow, I mean, we might have something crazy like a political election. We might have something crazy like, you know, a pandemic. We might have something crazy like a hurricane. Tomorrow, you might have a doctor's visit you didn't see coming. Tomorrow, someone might run a red light when you're not seeing it coming. Tomorrow might be a very different day for you to trust and stand upon the promises of God. And so we need a constant reminder for every day of our life, for everything that we face. And, and it's continually given. One of the greatest examples in here that I think is, is so important as he quotes from the book of Lamentations. In the book of Lamentations, a few pages away in chapter 3, he quotes where, where Jeremiah says this amazing truth that we hear oftentimes. There's a song written about it. You guys know which one I'm talking about? Jeremiah 3.23, what does he say? Great is thy faithfulness. Now, does anyone know what a lamentation is? We looked at this. It's a cry of, of sorrow and declaration all at the same time. It's a, it's a declaration of truth coupled with great sorrow. And that's a great description of what Jeremiah wrote. And he's lamenting the judgment of God that has brought the utter destruction upon the Hebrew people. And it's out of that that what you see is, is Daniel and the others that are discussed so much in here. That out of that destruction, they're taken captive, Nebuchadnezzar, those things. And so in the midst of that, Daniel utters, as he's describing the slaughter of his people. 
as he's describing the utter horrors of what had been done to them, he cries out, great is thy faithfulness. Here's the point. It is not dependent upon our circumstances. God's faithfulness is sufficient for the worst of times and the best of times. And there's multiple, multiple, multiple examples of that throughout. And you and I are going to have good days and we're going to have bad days. And so we need to be reminded of God's faithfulness. That's why it's a common theme on the pages of Scripture. He goes on and he goes through the absolute necessity of God being faithful. In so doing, he talks about our dependency upon his faithfulness for our salvation for our deliverance from temptation, for our sanctification, for the forgiveness of our sins, for deliverance through times of suffering, and for the fulfillment of eternal life, for our hope, our eternal hope. If God is not faithful, you can't believe any of those things. If God is not faithful, you can't stand. Now you might, in the moments when it seems like you're getting what you want, I remember a great example that was given one time, uh, and in that it was this question that was asked of a group. And it was this, if today you were walking down the street and you found a hundred dollar bill on the sidewalk, but tomorrow someone stole your credit card and ran up a thousand dollars in charges, was God less faithful on one day or more faithful on the other? Right? And how do we know that? Because we have Jeremiah lamenting and yet recognizing God's faithfulness. Because we see Job on both sides of that spectrum. Because we have the continual examples. And so it's such an important thing for us to recognize. To simply put it this way, we believe by faith in his faithfulness. That's what it means to be a Christian. That's what we receive is, God, I trust you. I trust your word. I trust your promise. I trust these things which have in fact been proven. Faith is hoping in that which is not yet seen. But it's not blind faith to be a Christian. If it was blind faith, Jesus would have said, or God would have said, hey, here's John 3.16. Y'all figure the rest out. Believe it or don't, here it is. No. Look at this. And this is what's amazing. When you consider, for example, some of the heroes of the faith, when we consider men like Joshua, Moses, when we consider men like David, and how much he relied on God's word. Think about this for a minute. When David pinning the Psalms about his experiences and crying out continually, Lord, in your word will I trust. How much of God's word did David have? He had definitely the Pentateuch, the first five. He had some, uh, he had the law and he had some of the uh, different aspects of, of the wisdom literature and other things. Some of that, not all of it. I mean, Proverbs hadn't been written, right? That's his son who wrote that, Ecclesiastes. Much of what we have such a grace, much. Like, just to maybe give you an example, here's, here's David who walked by faith and slew giants. Here, here's David who, who was a man after God's own heart. This is what he had. Here's Philip Smith. How blessed are we? How blessed are we to have these things? But when you, when you consider these examples, they've been given continually. 1 Corinthians 10 and, and other passages deal with what? Why have these examples been given? So that we can learn from them. So that we don't repeat their mistakes and so that we can grow in our own faithfulness from it. And so we are those who by faith, not blind faith, proven faith, by faith believe in his faithfulness. Because it doesn't really matter what he promises if we don't believe he's faithful to the accomplishment of it. Does it make sense? I just want you to understand a little bit of a working basis for the word faithful biblically and why it refers most specifically to God. On the next page, page 112, is where that quote from Lamentations 3.23, great is your faithfulness. And again, that's such a, such a good reminder. Uh, what caused Jeremiah to, to say that? I mean, listen, how many of you guys are familiar with, with the picture that's being given in Lamentations? When we use terms like scorched earth, it doesn't measure up to what Jeremiah was looking at when he wrote this. The description that Jeremiah gives to just give you the biblical understanding, and we don't need to go into the rest of the details, this should be the pinnacle of it. He said that the devastation was so utter that mothers were in fact eating their own children to avoid starvation. I can't comprehend. I cannot even begin to imagine. 
But that's what Jeremiah was in the midst of when he uttered, great is your faithfulness. What was it that caused Jeremiah to utter that? His circumstances? His present conditions? His faith in God's faithfulness is what caused Jeremiah to utter that. That's who we are. That's always who we will be in every circumstance. So our recognition of God's faithfulness is not about our circumstances. And that's an important truth. And that is such an important truth for us to be about the business of cultivating this fruit of the Spirit, which is our own faithfulness. If we don't recognize God's faithfulness, we will never be those who do the labor, as we're going to look at, in cultivating faithfulness in our own life. It will be impossible. If God's not faithful, I can't. Right? That's, that's why we need to take a moment and understand these things. So, jumping from that, he goes on, and I want to clarify one thing on page 112 in the middle. He says, in our effort to become like God in our character, he's not wrong in that statement. Right? I don't want someone to read that and be like, oh, so, so I'm the one doing, I do my own work? No, in Philippians 2, we have that passage where Paul says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And we've talked about, that's, that's not you coming to a greater understanding like figuring out a math problem. That is you taking that which God has worked into you, a new heart, a heart of flesh that was once a heart of stone, and you taking those truths and working them into, working them out into your life. That's why when you read Ephesians and Colossians, they say, put off the old man. Put on the new man. Do not lie one to another. Instead, speak in these terms. And what it's saying is God's made you new. God has given you a new heart. You are now, that which was dead is alive. And you work that out. But then what's the next verse say in Philippians 2? Knowing, knowing that it is he who works within you. So there is that combination in your sanctification. And that's what I want to talk about. In our faithfulness, it's a gift of the Spirit that he has given. You cannot get there on your own. But we bear the labor of working that gift out into maturity into our lives. And that's what I want us to see in the practicality of this. I don't, I don't know that you would have considered. I don't know that I considered the, the basic practical realities of faithfulness in my life. I mean, here's the definition that he talks about. It shows itself in absolute honesty. It shows itself in utter dependability. And it shows itself in unswerving loyalty. Man, those are really great character traits. If I had to name things that I want in a friend, right? Things that I want in a business partner. Things that I want in my, my spouse. And, and that she would want for me. Those would definitely be there. These are, these are practical, basic things that the term faithfulness encompass so well. So, with that, just running through some of these things. Um, this is one of the things that he notices. It's not natural. It's not a natural virtue. As is indicated by Solomon's lament in Proverbs 20. He says, many a man claims to have unfailing love. But a faithful man, who can find? Many a man claims, many a man says it with his mouth, but one who actually does it, who can find? Why is it so hard to be faithful? Think about it. Why is it so hard to be faithful? Yeah, absolutely. Number one, it's not natural for you. Your flesh is in contradiction to it, which Peter tells us in 1 Peter 2, that our flesh is at war against our soul. But secondly, and we're going to see this more fully in those, if you're absolutely honest, if you're utterly dependable and unswervingly loyal, it will cost you. You'll have to deny self at a significant level on a regular basis in order to maintain those things. And we'll see that more fully. But that's the reason that few can find that because it costs. It will cost you. What will it cost you? Heavenly things? No, it will actually build those. It's not going to cost you eternal things, but it will cost you temporal things. It will cost you momentary things. It will at times cause you to have to make a choice that says, I'm going to be that even though it might in fact destroy me financially, it might, in fact, destroy me. And we'll, we'll look at some of those examples he gives in here. But there's a great cost. It's often costly, and few people are willing to pay the price. 
The dictionary, the biblical word, denotes that which is firm and can be counted on. That's just the basic biblical definition of faithfulness. The the dictionary is not far off. Faithfulness is defined as uh, firm in adherence to promises or an observation of duty. Some common synonyms that are found are dependable, reliable, trustworthy, and loyal. This makes sense. It just makes sense, but I'm afraid that if you simply look at it through the lens of how you grew up hearing that term in the church, how many times did you connect the fruit of the spirit of faithfulness with dependability? Right? It's not common. I don't don't think we think that way well. And so I'm thankful that, that he's brought us to that this evening. He uses the example of Daniel. We're not going to spend a lot of time with that. But in Daniel's example, this is such a good point. Uh, when, when Daniel, when they were seeking to come after him so that he might be thrown in the lion's den. It says in Daniel chapter 6 and verse 4 that his rivals tried to find grounds for charges to be brought against Daniel. And his conduct of government affairs. But they were unable to do so. That's a great measurement, right? They were unable to do so. When you look at your life, and John says this quite frequently, when he speaks in terms of uh, qualifications for deacons and elders and just basic Christian living, he says that anyone can accuse anyone of anything. But we should never be those who are in fact guilty. That's where you have to be mindful. And again, none of us measure up perfectly in this. But at the same time, we're going to talk about patterns and other things. So the first one he comes to is simply the, oh, before we get to that, he says this on page 113 in the final paragraph before we get to absolute honesty. And he makes this this recognition uh, from Daniel chapter 6. They were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. And this is something just as you're studying God's word, it is good for you to recognize what I will call logical or common sense contrasts. These are important. That when you see something where it says, for example, one who is faithful receives that, then you can clearly come to the conclusion, well, one who is unfaithful won't receive that. When it says something like Romans 8 and verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, I can logically infer that that means that there is therefore yet still condemnation for those who are not in Christ Jesus. It's just a little hermeneutical or study principle that's helpful as you're studying to go a little deeper. And so what he says here is the words corrupt and negligent help us define by contrast what it in fact means to be faithful in our daily affairs. Because the word corrupt is the opposite of honest or ethical. And the word negligent is an antonym of such words as careful, thoughtful, and considerate. So that's always helpful to me. It broadens my definition in such a way that things don't fall through the cracks. So with that, he goes into absolute honesty. And he goes through just a a quick reference point of some of the things that God says about dishonesty. He lists them, and I just want you to listen to these words. The scriptures tell us that the Lord detests lying lips, but he delights in men who are truthful. And the Lord abhors dishonest scales, but accurate weights are his delight. The Lord detests lying and he abhors dishonest business transactions. Not only are we commanded not to lie, we are also commanded not to deceive or be deceitful in any manner. And we're going to talk about some of the common ways. Lying has been, has been defined as any deceit in word, act, attitude, or silence. And deliberate exaggerations and distortions of the truth or in creating false impressions. Guys, when we speak of this faithfulness and we start to recognize one of the major components of that is honesty or as he defines it, absolute honesty. It touches on everything. In, in Song of Solomon, he speaks of, of the foxes, the little foxes who can utterly destroy a vineyard. Well, in the same way, I think that this is an area that that we're prone to say, oh, it's just one little fox. It's no big deal. He can't eat that many grapes, can he? (laughs) Oh, yeah. Given enough time, he will bankrupt you. And in the same way, I want us to see these things. Some Some of the ways in which lies are carried out that are oftentimes justified and overlooked, and we'll talk about the big ones that are obvious, but some of the things that stand out to me are lies of omission. Lies of omission. Those things which you know, if you share it, correction will follow. And so you avoid sharing it. That's a lie of omission. 
that's a big deal. And scripture addresses that, right? We, we can define it white lies. He calls them social lies. Social lies, we'll, we'll look at some of those things. But what I want you to understand is when it speaks in terms of absolute honesty, that's a good working biblical understanding. If God hates deceit, can I just say to you, it means God hates deceit, period, period. And we need to come under that. Not that any of us are going to arrive at perfection, but we're not even going to do the work to strive for it, to cultivate it, to, to grow this, to work this reality out. If we're not right arena of our life. Uh, there's a passage in Proverbs 20. Proverbs is replete with wonderful truth about this. But in Proverbs 26, there's one that's always stood out to me because I think it's a common one. And uh, this is what the uh, author says in verse 18 and 19. Like a madman who throws firebrands, arrows, and death. You guys seen some of the, some of the riots and other things going on? See the picture of them? I mean, they, they look a little mentally demented. And they're throwing fireworks and other things. I mean, there's, there's some struggles there. Picture that with what the author's saying. Like a madman who throws firebrands, arrows, and death. Man, he must be talking about some kind of a crazy, lunatic, suicidal maniac. What is he talking about? <laughs> we'll look at the next verse. So is the man who deceives his neighbor and says, was I not joking? Guys, just think about that for a minute. You ever said something and then realize, uh-oh, and so your immediate response, I was just kidding. Did you know the scripture addresses that? To that degree? So when we speak in terms of absolute honesty, I'm just simply trying to lay a strong foundation so that we're not prone to start at this layer and leave this whole layer, we'll call it the little foxes in the vineyard layer, down here still corrupting and other things. Let's get down to the foundation. God hates deceit in every form and facet. He abhors it. He detests it. These are strong words that are meant to convey a strong meaning. God hates it. So, with that in mind, let's jump into what does it mean to be absolutely honest? He gives this example, if, if you've read the book, if not, I'll just really quickly paraphrase. He gives this example of someone brought some cookies in uh, to him as the, at the church, uh, or in some setting. And a little bit later that week, this little child runs up to him and says, did you enjoy the cookies? And he hadn't tasted them yet. He says, but rather than let her down, I said, oh, they were wonderful. And he said, that ate at me and ate at me and ate at me. Why? Because it wasn't honest. Was it told with good intention? Sure, he didn't want to hurt that child's feelings. But good intentions don't change that, do they? Now, I'm not saying motives don't matter, but when you sin, motives don't matter. Let's be clear. Once sin is accomplished, then motive has very little to do with that. Now, it might play a part in understanding and accomplishing forgiveness, but it does not play a part in making an excuse for the sin. You got to deal with that first. And the sin is the lie. And you got to deal with that first. And so he focuses on that. He calls, that's what he calls a social sin or a social lie. And so with that, he, he goes into that whole thing uh, and, and gives some examples. And then I want to jump over to page 115. Why is it so important? Why do these little things matter? Well, because they grow into patterns. They grow into patterns. Listen, he says that on page 115, right in the middle. He says, why do I go into such detail about absolute honesty in the social minutia of life? Because this is where honesty begins, right? This, this is where honesty begins. If we are careful to be honest in the little things, then we will most certainly be careful to be honest in the more important things of life. If we are honest about the cookies in our life, we will certainly be honest in our business transactions, our college examinations, and even our sports competitions. And then he quotes from Luke 16, and this is such an important truth. This is in the parallel account where, where Luke is dealing with Jesus' words regarding you can't serve two masters. And listen to what he says in Luke's account of it in verse 10. He who is faithful... And a very little thing is also faithful in much. And he who is unrighteous in a very little thing is unrighteous also in much. And this is important. This is where patterns of life come out of. Because that which you accept at this level will eventually 
grow. When you plant that seed of it's okay to lie here, that seed will grow and produce fruit. When you plant the seed of it's not okay to lie here, that seed will grow and produce fruit. I want to read some statistics that I, was re that I read in an article uh, as I was studying for this. Listen to this. Lying is ingrained into human beings. Listen to this. By the age of four years old, 90% of children have grasped the concept of lying, according to a study conducted by the Institute of Child Study at Toronto University, while 20% of two-year-olds lie. Look at what happens in that short time. 20%, 90%. And that's huge. It happens quick. I saw when I came in tonight a quote from Spurgeon that's continually on our screen in, in different places. And it says, teach early because children sin early. And that's not an exact quote, but that's basically what it says. Teach early because children begin to sin early. It goes on in the article and it says this, according to a 2002 study, and I don't think this is getting better. Like what it was in 2002, I don't think it's improved to today, but in a 2002 study conducted by the University of Massachusetts, goodness, 60% of adults could not hold a 10-minute conversation without lying at least once. Did you guys hear that? This is the fruit of the Spirit. Don't think it's not, and it won't come easy and natural. It will come supernaturally. And then we who are born again supernaturally regenerated by the washing of the Spirit, we then work in these things. I just want to read that again. 60% of adults in this study could not hold a 10-minute conversation without lying at least once. My, my desperate prayer is that none of them were professing Christians. But who knows? It goes on. Unfortunately, the more a person lies, the easier and more tempting it becomes. A 2016 study conducted by a neuroscience group showed that dishonesty actually alters a person's brain at a chemical level, making it easier to lie in the future and making a person more prone to tell even bigger falsehoods. Now, biblically, we see that same principle. Paul describes it as a seared conscience. Paul describes it as a seared conscience. This is someone who has that little bit of, don't do that. And what you do is you say to that conscience, shut up, I'm going to do it. And enough times of that happening and it shuts up. It becomes silent. It becomes seared, hardened. It's no longer soft. And so it's a very biblical reality that, that stands out that they're recognizing it in secular uh, tests and other things that, listen, when someone gets a pattern of lying, it will grow. You might think it's no big deal to tell a lie in this setting or in that or in other things, but know this ahead of time, that which is a pattern for you here will not stay there. Biblically, secularly, undoubtedly, this is known as a fact. So I think that's an important reality in that. Um, and he speaks, too, of an article he read in one of our leading business journals that quoted a number of executives as saying it was impossible to succeed in business today without compromising the truth. The point is, what I want you to understand is that 60% of adults can't carry a 10-minute conversation without lying. Most of those who are functioning or succeeding in business are saying that they can't do so if they're absolutely honest. And so it becomes a common thing of, well, this is just how life is. This is the culture we live in. This is the society. I mean, we've got to pay our electric bill, right? We have to somehow function in this, but it's neglecting that we are called to be salt and light. That yes, society is going to do sinful things. It's going to be dark and we're to shine light into it. Yes, society is decaying and we're to be salt that slows the putrefaction and decay that's being given. The, it, scripture is not a, silent on these things. Scripture has in fact spoken, and so it's spoken in direct contradiction and opposition to culture, to society, to business practices that are secular. We don't get to say, well, if I'm going to function in business, I have to lay my, leave my faith at the door. We don't get to do that. That's not a fruit of the Spirit. That's in fact the opposite of a fruit of the Spirit. So with that, uh, we go on and, and recognize these things. Um, one of the notes I made down here is when someone lies, okay, I hope we've established at this point, when someone lies, they're wrong, 
right? It's sin. When someone lies, they're wrong. Now, when someone's wrong, but they're not ready to admit they're wrong, what's the next natural thing that comes? Blame and justification. What are some of the common blames that come up for why we told a lie? What is it? Yeah, it's, it's your fault. I knew you were going to be angry. I, I, knew, I knew I was going to get in trouble. I didn't want to get in trouble. Right? I, I, knew you were gonna, I knew this wasn't going to go well. So therefore it was okay for me to tell that lie because it's your fault. Because you weren't going to handle the truth well. And it's such a lie, right? We recognize, and he goes into great detail, that Satan is the father of lies. It's his native tongue. And his followers, the followers of Satan, those who are the children of the devil, as 1 John describes them, are those who themselves take part in the practices of Satan. This is a major one of those. When it describes Satan as the father of lies and says his native tongue is lying, that's a very, man, that is a very set-apart description. Like it focuses in on this particular area as a really big deal, wouldn't you say? And so with that, think, think about these terms. When we start to shift the blame, when we start to see that it's, that it's wrong, we want to immediately look for someone else to, to say, well, it's, it's their fault. There's a reason for this. It, it's not me. Well, the problem is that doesn't, that, where does it end? There will always be some reason. And it's funny how that overtakes someone. I'll never forget, I was dealing with a young lady who had grown up kind of in our youth ministry, had heard truth, had in some forms imbibed that, but then the world just overtook her. And as a young adult, this had, had taken her over. And I'll never forget, right before that happened, there was a situation where she had truly been in many ways striving to grow in some form of holiness and godliness in her home, still living under her parents' roof and other things. And there was a situation that had arisen that she made us aware of from something that had happened in her past. It wasn't a present thing, but it had just surfaced in the present. And I'll never forget, it was this crazy thing where she said to us, do I have to tell my mom? And then she told us why that was a concern. Anyone want to guess why that was a concern? She said, my mom's just started to trust me. If I tell her the truth, she'll stop trusting me. If you don't think Satan takes and flips this world on its head and makes us believe craziness, but she wasn't wrong. That's a very common thing. She was absolutely, in a sense, accurate. But think about how wrong that is in our society that I have a young lady saying to me, if I'm honest, if I'm honest, I'm going to lose trust. It's not true. I guarantee, yes, there would have been some moments of struggle and consequence for her honesty. But big picture, it would have changed the course of many things. Instead of developing a pattern, planting that seed of this is, this is okay because, you know, I, I want to be trusted. I, I have really good intentions in this. And honestly, it was, a, it was a very past mistake. It's not something I'm doing. And if I, if I tell my mom I'm going to get in trouble for it, I'm going to be grounded or whatever. And, and, and really, I don't deserve to be grounded because I haven't done this in a long time. And I just can't believe this is showing up now or whatever the case may be. How backwards is that? I mean, just think about it. Strip aside all the excuses, strip aside all the culture, strip aside all the reasoning, and just consider this. How crazy is it that someone would say, if I'm honest, I'm going to be less trusted. But that's what's been twisted, flipped, and given to us. It's a big deal, these patterns that we see developing. Listen, patterns are the fabric of our lives, aren't they? When you look at me, there are certain patterns, big picture patterns, right? From about September until February, there's a very specific pattern in Pastor Philip's life that, that if you know me at all, you can nail down. It's called deer season, right? There's a very specific pattern. There's fabrics, and that's big picture, not very consequential, but it's patterns in our life. There are things that you know, oh, Philip's going to act differently or do things differently for a short season because of this. Or because of that. Same thing in smaller pictures, right? You get into the rhythm and swing of life and you develop a basic, this is who I am, this is how I do things. Well, they quickly become the fabric of who you are. That's why it's so important to deal with this in the minutia. When we say absolute honesty, that's what scripture says. Why? Because God detests dishonesty and deceit. So, 
The next one, page 116, we get to the second component of, huh. and you know, I remember when I was studying and teaching through the book of James, and we got into uh, James, where, where James is just dealing with how we're supposed to face um, and deal with uh, trials right out of the gate, and then we got into some other stuff, and then he gets to the tongue, and I remember the commentator, the pastor, one of the, the commentaries I enjoyed reading on that. And he said this. He said, at this point, James just started meddling. It, like, he, he just really just started meddling in all of our lives at this point. And, and that's kind of what, what this next one's going to be. For some of you, this is going to be like, yeah, I'm totally on board. I can't stand when someone's not these things. And others are going to be like, oh, this is an area I really got to work on. So with that utter dependability... He uses the example continuing of Daniel. He said he was neither corrupt nor negligent. He was reliable and dependable. And by the way, I see the parallels when we look at the parables we've just walked through. The parable of the ten virgins. The parable of the, the three servants who received the talents. When we look at those, can we not see God's demand of reliability, dependability, preparedness, readiness, right? There's a whole lot of stuff, and Proverbs addresses this a lot. So he goes on, he says, if people could count on him. In other words, he can extrapolate this. Now, and I don't think he's wrong, although it is not explicitly worded in Scripture. He says this, he undoubtedly was on time for his appointments, kept his commitments, honored his word, and considered how his actions might affect others. Few things are more vexing than relying on someone who is not dependable. And he quotes from Proverbs chapter 10 where Solomon, this is such an accurate and great description. It's so vivid. Solomon says this in Proverbs 10 and verse 26, As vinegar is to the teeth and smoke to the eyes, so is a sluggard to those who send him. Man, if, you, if you're an employer here or you're someone who is tasked with a role over men, you know exactly what Solomon's saying. It is that which is just, okay, <laughs> I have no idea how this is going to go, but I got no one else. I'm going to send this guy to do a job and I'm absolutely confident he's not going to do it well. Versus, think about this. Think about the guy who's at work that you can have confidence that when you send him, he's going to do a better job than you send him to do. It's going to be cleaned up. It's going to be completed. One of the big struggles in the younger generation coming up is they weren't taught to complete what they started. They'll hit it like gangbusters, right? They'll come out wanting to prove and do a good job and be pleasing, but they don't bring it to the fullness of completion. They bring it to their standard of it. And that's something we need to teach the next generation. That's something we need to example and, and help them in, not just say, you guys aren't doing it right. We, we want to raise them up and grow them up. And this is a major area, major area. I was thankful for the men this morning. We had 21 men uh, that were there and, and I got tickled. Normally, normally when I have a 6 a.m. men's Bible study, a lot, it, how can I word this? A lot of the more mature men in their age bracket are there first and we sit around, sip some coffee and wait on the younger guys to show up. This morning, the first six guys through the door were under 25. I was so proud. I, I was so thankful to see that next generation. And not that the older guys were late, not by any means, but it was just to see this younger generation saying, oh, we're, we're going to be there. 6 a.m. is not easy, y'all, especially not for that generation usually, for that age group, not generation. Uh, back when I was that age, it wasn't easy. So I was thankful for that. This is a big deal. Dependability is a, is a very specific and necessary thing. He goes on, he says this, uh, down towards the bottom of page 116, uh, towards the middle down, he says, if our society needs to re-emphasize the virtue of honesty, it certainly needs to place great importance on dependability. Dependability has taken a decided backseat to personal desire or convenience. That's what you have to fight against. Those are the yellow flags or those are the things in your life that come up. Those are the desires of your flesh that you have to look at and say, whoa, whoa, whoa. those can't take precedence over this. It's, he gives this example. I'll keep that commitment if it's convenient seems to be the attitude of our age. He quotes uh, here a, a man on, in the middle of page 116. He says, if we probe a bit deeper, we see that unfaithfulness is very close to disobedience. Disobedience. 
For the man who disobeys God has cast himself loose from the only solid support a man can have. And his direction in life will be controlled by the shifting winds of circumstances and of his whimsical desire. This man, the man who is not controlled by God, listen to this, has no settled reason to keep his word or to discharge his obligations. And that's true. That's true. One of the things I can tell you definitively from being in business as an unbeliever and having a, a work ethic and integrity of wanting to please my dad possibly or all the different reasons that those things were established, that had a point that would break, right? I might be a man of integrity and work ethic up to $5,000, 10000 I don't know. I'm, I'm just giving you an example. There is a point that I can definitively say as an unbeliever in areas where it would have broken, where it would have been justified. Well, there's no way. And, and I can see that in some areas, certainly with taxes and, and other things where there was much justification of, yeah, that's ridiculous. I disagree with that. Therefore, which by the way, on any area, just think for a moment how that would fly in the courtroom. Not that I know this from personal experience, but I've heard stories of guys to take, for example, and think that maybe some of the uh, wildlife restrictions on hunting and fishing don't really apply to them because they were here first before any of those things mattered or whatever reason they give. I just want you to picture when that guy goes and stands before the judge and says, Your Honor, I just want you to understand that I was born here and I think that that law regarding lobster is ridiculous and stupid and it only exists because so many northerners came down so it doesn't apply to me. And so because of that, Your Honor, it's just stupid that I'm even here today missing work. How's that going to go? Is the judge going to be like, man, you are so right? I don't think so. And you know it's not going to. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. This is what it is. And we need to recognize it. We don't need to come up with all the reasons. We, we must have a settled reason. A deep down bedrock conviction that will overrule Every circumstance and every subjective opportunity or struggle that comes our way. And there's only one thing that's unchanging. There's only one thing that does not change according to your circumstances, according to your generation, according to the culture. It never changes. That is the settled word of God. That is our standard. And the standard he's given is very clear. Um, going on, he gives multiple examples uh, of that. And, and I would just encourage you to read it. I think we get the big picture on dependability. It's absolutely a component of faithfulness. It, you cannot claim faithfulness if you are not dependable. You cannot claim faithfulness if you have patterns of deceit in your life. And then our final one, unswerving loyalty. I, I like this one a lot. I mean, when I think in terms of what I expect and what I hope I can be to others, this is a huge one. He says that the faithful person is not only honest and dependable, but also loyal. The issue of loyalty arises most often in connection with our friends or relationships. The word has come to have a connotation of sticking with someone through thick and thin. There is perhaps no greater description of loyalty than Solomon's words. A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. There is no such person as a fair-weathered friend. If a person's loyalty does not ensure his faithfulness to another in times of stress, then he really isn't a friend. And that's true. We recognize that. It goes on and he talks in terms of King Saul's son Jonathan is a great illustration. And absolutely, if you're familiar with Jonathan and David's relationship and those things, uh, in the end, his loyalty to David cost him the throne to Israel. As it should have. As it should have. And this, he, he says this, whether it be in honesty or dependability or loyalty, faithfulness is frequently a costly virtue, virtue, right? We talked about that at the beginning and then he makes this note again, only the Holy Spirit can enable us to pay that price. We have victory over sin, but we have to then exercise or practice that victory. It's been given, but as Paul says to the Galatians, are you so quickly abandoning this freedom which you have been given? Uh, the picture, I remember one time Brody, uh, many of you know Brody, gave the example. He said it, it would be like if you would picture a slave ship transporting slaves uh, to, to their destination. And en route, this, this other ship comes alongside, cannonballs them, 
rescues the slaves, breaks their shackles, gets them on the deck. And then as that ship with all of the stinking filth and all that it stood for and everything else is sinking, the slaves started jumping back overboard and swimming back to that ship. That's how ridiculous is this picture of we who have been given victory and freedom from sin returning to it like a dog does to its vomit. It's a graphic picture and it rightly should be. It should be that which gives us pause. It should be that which gives us a moment to say, whoa, hold on just a moment. And so in this, there, there's a measure where there is going to be cost. There's going to be temptation throughout our lives to return back from. There will be failure. First John says that when you fail, go to God. Confess your sin. He is faithful and just to forgive your sin. Go to the one whom you've sinned against. Seek their forgiveness. Confess it. Work through it. It's not the end of the world, the fact that we're sinners, because of grace. Because of grace. And we never want to forget that. It goes on and he makes this distinction. I think this is very important. There is a kind of loyalty that we must avoid. He would call this a blind loyalty. And that's a big point. That's a very big point. It's a disservice to someone if you have blind loyalty to them. No matter what, you disagree with them. No matter what, you're on their side. Listen, if you go there, even if it's wrong, I'm going with you. No, as Christians, we don't act that way. And he gives the example here. <laughs> in my preaching lab class, every time that someone would get up and give a sermon, the teacher, Rick Holland, the brother that we know very well, you always knew when he would begin by quoting Proverbs 27.6. Uh-oh. If you're familiar, Proverbs 27.6 is this. Uh, the kisses of an enemy may be profuse, but faithful are the wounds of a friend. And you knew it was about to happen. You were about to be wounded. <laughs> and it was going to hurt. But it was because of his faithfulness, his desire that these young men would grow in their ability to, to preach and teach God's word, the weight of what that carries. That it was a good thing that they be wounded here rather than carry that forth unwounded and continuing in it. He goes on, he says, only the truly faithful friend cares enough about you or me to undertake the often thankless task of pointing out where we are wrong. None of us enjoys being confronted with our faults, sins, and mistakes. And so we often make it difficult for our friends to do so. As a result, most of us are more concerned about speaking agreeableness to each other than about speaking the truth. This is not loyalty. Loyalty speaks the truth and faithfulness and also it speaks in love. Loyalty says, I care enough about you that I will not allow you to continue unchecked in your wrong actions or sinful attitude that will ultimately be harmful to you. And we've talked about this. That's why Matthew 18 is such a gift to the church. Because it's a great guardrail. It's a, it's a great protection. If your brother sins, go to him in private. If he doesn't listen... You know the steps that continue. Why is God so concerned? Because he loves you. And sin is that which enslaves and destroys you. When someone does not confront someone else in sin, they have a wrong view of one of two things. They have a wrong view of love or they have a wrong view of sin. And they've come to believe that somehow sin isn't as big of a deal as scripture makes it so it'll be okay. Or they've come to believe that it's unloving to actually protect their brother or sister from that which scripture says will utterly destroy their life. So blind loyalty is not the biblical picture of loyalty that we're talking about. We come to this final section on page 119 and this is where the labor begins. This is how do we do this? How do we do this? Meeting God's requirements. There's, there's a saying... Uh, the first time I went, first or second time I went to LA, uh, quite an experience for me to go to LA. And we landed at LAX and, and we were standing with a group. One of the guys there recognized him. I think they were like some, some well-known rap artist or hip-hop artist or something. And one of them had his hat on and he had it backwards, thankfully, so I could read it from behind. And it was a black hat and it said in white letters, strive and grind. And I just thought, man, what a great picture of our sanctification. How do we cultivate? How do we grow in maturity? How, we strive and we grind. That is the reality of Christianity. And too often times people are never told that. They're given some other picture that faithfulness is something that's going to filter down through the night from the Holy Spirit. And they're going to wake up tomorrow and be faithful. Um, no. You are going to work this out with fear and trembling. And you can have confidence as you do that that God will accomplish it by his strength. This is the truth of this statement. 
He goes on and he says this, as with the other graces of Christian character, the first step in growing in faithfulness is to acknowledge the biblical standard. Faithfulness entails absolute honesty, utter dependability, and unswerving loyalty. He goes on, he says, here's the three steps. Number one, you have to develop convictions consistent with this standard based on the word of God. That's why we spent so much time laying the foundation of how does God actually view this and why is his own faithfulness so important to us? Number two, you have to evaluate your life with the aid of the Holy Spirit and perhaps a spouse or close friend. Evaluate. How many times are we telling you, examine yourself, test yourself? I don't do an altar call, but one of the main things that you'll hear continually at the end of every message is in light of these things, brothers and sisters, examine yourself to see, are you truly in the faith? Is there a reality of these things in your life? Do you need to repent from them not being there? Maybe as a believer, repent and pursue them. Or as one who is not a believer, repent for the first time. Trust the Lord and pursue him. Guys, we must be those who are evaluating constantly. Constantly examining ourselves. Because I can tell you, none of us are perfect. The Apostle Paul has not yet arrived in his lifetime and neither have any of us. So we need to be constantly growing. And then we do it with the aid of the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? Prayer and study, right? That's what the Spirit's given. The Spirit has given these things. So through prayer, we seek God's wisdom. We we go to the Lord confessing these things. We're we're constantly going to the Lord asking for opportunities to reveal and and give us greater clarity in this. And we're going to his word to understand where am I lacking? What is the light unto my path shining that says, oh, there's a really big pothole right in front of you that you you need to put the light on and see? that's the simplicity of this. It's not some go up on the top of Mount Everest, sit with a candle in front of you and and reach nirvana so that the Spirit can speak to you. That is not Christianity. It is not faith. It is not the truth of these things. It is us seeking these things through the means that have been given. And then having others in our life. How many times we've done massive studies on discipleship? On the realities of having these relationships of Titus 2, shepherding, iron on iron, accountability in our lives. The necessities that are provided through the body of Christ. Where you see a specific need, make that both a matter of prayer for the aid of the Holy Spirit and the object of some concrete actions on your part. And he makes this point that we talked about earlier from Philippians 2. Remember that your working and his working are coextensive. And he, he says this so simply, I love it. You cannot become a faithful person merely by trying. There is a divine dimension, but it is also true that you will not become a faithful person without trying. And so that's the simple reminder that that yes, we strive and we grind and we trust that the Lord is going to take those things and accomplish his purposes in them. So, very practical, very clear, very straightforward. This is who we are. In Christ, because of his faithfulness, by which or in which we have faith, we now have been granted these things that we might grow them into maturity in our lives and that our lives might be a reflection of Christ to the glory of God. Do you all pray with me this evening? Lord, we are so thankful for these gifts from your spirit, Lord, that you, in fact, through regeneration, through our new birth, through the deadness being brought to life, Uh, that once was the reality of our life and now we are new creations in you, that through those things, Lord, we've been given freedom, a pathway to the accomplishment of a new man. And Lord, by your strength, you will carry us and complete that work that you have begun in us. But Lord, you have called us. We who are truly yours are those who will constantly be desiring the things which you desire. And Lord, in that desire, we will be striving for godliness. We will be striving for faithfulness. We will be striving for all the components that make up faithfulness. And we will be fighting, putting off that which is unfaithful and putting on that which is faithful. Lord, you have given these things at great cost. Lord, we have studied and are studying in preparation even for the conclusion of your gospel account in Matthew of the cost with which you have brought these gifts to us. Lord, let us not be those who are neglectful. Let us be those because of you who strive for each of these, knowing that in our inadequacy, you are our adequacy. And we can trust you for this. Lord, I thank you for the men and women that are here and for those who are listening.